as we prayed, forgive us our debts as we forgive those that are indebted against us. That, that we ask God to forgive us as we forgive other people. That forgiveness is key, and it's one of the big things that you do. God takes care of justice. Our job is to forgive other people, and we give justice to God. We leave it into his hands. Today, we're going to continue this message in talking about security, and that God is taking care of our security. He's handling in our fi- He's with our finances. He's touching our bodies. He's in control of our security. Even when our security seems to be threatened, God is always watching. And today I've asked Silo to come. We're going we're gonna to get part two from last week when Ricky meets God and has another conversation with God. Now let me say this. Ricky's better than the skit, okay? <laughs> He's a godly young man. <laughs> and, uh, but but uh, this, this is Ricky and God, part two, dealing with security. Apply yourself, use the gifts I've already given you, and I'll bless it. We ask God many different ways. He comes back with the same answer every time, over and over. Sometimes he changes the method that he answers, but it's always the same message. But we always want what we want. And sometimes when we're asking things, we ask amiss, the Bible says. God's watching us. He cares for us. And it's our job to fall in line with him because what he wants is what's better for us. It's been defined that God's will is what you would do if you knew what God knew. And God knows everything about you and he's watching. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows so for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. God's watching you. Psalms chapter 91, verses 8 through 16. Talking about trouble. 
real trouble and problems. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him, and long life will I satisfy him with and show him my salvation. God loves you. God is watching you. Your security is in his hands. There's a lot of things we worry about that are not life-threatening. They're not eternity issues. But God is watching the big stuff. God has your security in his hands. Do you really believe that? That's what it comes down to. Trusting God with the big things in life. Only with your eyes shall you see the reward of the wicked. Only with your eyes will you see things that people should really be afraid of. Sometimes your trial could be a stepping stone. It could be something that God is using to help other people. That hassle at work, that teacher that is so, that kids, that teacher that is so uh, not understanding of your, your situation. Sometimes God may use you to help them. Your hassle could be someone else's blessing. God is watching. God is taking care of everything. And I especially love that part that he's given his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. I believe the Bible's true. So believe in that. I do believe that angels know who I am. That angels are given charge by God himself. Okay, David's leaving town. I need, I need you to watch him. I need, I need you to uh, look over him. I had a preacher friend of mine. He's preached here, Bob Miller. Probably the worst driver ever. I mean, this guy, was, he's terrible. I was, not he was. He's older. He's probably worse than he was when he was, I was with him. His wife, you would think she'd become numb of his bad driving habits. It just got worse. We'd get in the car, and he'd start saying, oh, dear Lord, you know. And he said, honey, I'm just cranking the car. What are you doing? And then I began to realize why she was so nervous. And I heard someone say, they said, listen, when Bob Miller's on the road, don't get out there. Don't do anything dangerous because all the angels are on assignment around Bob Miller. That's the only reason that man's still alive. God's given his angels charge over you. That's not a myth. It's not a good saying. It's the truth. He loves you. And his angels not only minister to him, but they're for us too. They've devoted their love to us also because God's affection is upon you. And what God loves, they love. And their job is you. When you pray, God commissions them to begin to move and to begin to do things on our behalf. They're tireless in what they do. Security is one of the big stuff, one of the big things. It's God's business. Mom and Dad used to sing a song, Why Worry When You Can Pray. Has anyone ever heard that? Trust Jesus, he'll be your stay. Boy, don't be a doubting Thomas. Rest fully on his promise. And Dad would go, why worry, 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 worry when you can pray. Why worry? Worry is interest paid on something that will probably never happen. Worry sometimes communicates to God that you don't really trust him. I believe in God, but I don't really trust him. That doesn't make sense. If you believe in God, trust him with your big stuff. That's your health, your finances, and your protection. Fear is what it is, but, you know, I've heard people say, I'm concerned. Don't let your concern turn into fear. Concern is, I'm concerned about how things are going. Fear is, I don't trust God to help me and to protect me. You can be concerned, but don't be afraid because God is in control of your security. God holds 
the universe together by him and through him. All things consist and have their being. Even the trouble, even the crisis that you might find yourself in. God's holding it together. It's not out of control. He's working a plan. Where there's God, there's always a plan. And like we talked last week, God doesn't have a plan B or C. He's got plan A. And when we fail at plan A, he brings plan A back to the front. And we work plan A again until we get it. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. That's things you see and things we still haven't discovered yet. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the substance of everything. He's got your security. It's okay. When I was younger, I was a youth pastor in Colleen. I was asked to be on a security detail, and I found out it, was, it wasn't a security detail. I'm sorry, I was, I was going to drive for Vice President Quayle. It was a, not, not for him, actually. I was in his motorcade, and I was standing there with some of the Secret Service agents, and we were standing behind the ropes, and the Vice President was giving a speech in the Sheridan Hotel, and I was standing out by the car, and, and I, I was trying to talk to the Secret Service agents. They just don't talk very much to people. You know, I couldn't get under those sunglasses, you know, and, and he just, and I'd start talking to him, and he'd just look to his left, and he'd look to his right, you know. And every now and then, I'd get a gentle nod, maybe, if I was very fortunate. But I thought, you know, he's not paying attention to me, and, and he's just ignoring me, but I kept trying to talk to him, because I was bored, and I'm a talkable guy, I, you know. I'm a people person, my wife's laughing, yeah. I'm a people person, I, I, you know, I like to engage. And about that time, a good friend of mine, who was the minister of music at Faith Temple, he comes running up. He gets out of his car, and, and we have that roped-off cord in, uh, you know, the area, and he's got this basket filled with chocolate, fruit, breads. I mean, Ronnie has went out, you know, he's an Italian guy, you know, and he, he's went out and got all these goodies to give to the vice president. And he knew that I was driving in the motorcade, so he thought, I've got an end road. So he starts running toward us with this big basket of fruit, bread, and chocolate. What does a Secret Service man see with someone running toward the motorcade with a gigantic package? Of course they thought he was a bomber. And as they were, he was running to him, I mean, my guy immediately sprung into action and about five other guys I didn't even know around immediately began to converge upon Ronnie and right before they got to him you know I thought of just not saying anything <laughs> but right before they got there I said hold it I know him I know him and as soon as I said that this thought came and said who are you <laughs> but apparently the secret service agent had been listening to me I had some credibility. I mean, at least he knew I passed a background check that morning. And he stopped. And he held his hands back and stopped all those agents. And I thought, that's right. <laughs> I give him my okay. <laughs> Friends, let me tell you something. You have more protection. You have more agents surrounding you than the vice president and the president do have combined. God is watching you. He loves you. He's concerned about the things that you're worried about, even if they're inconsequential to the big picture. Did you notice when Ricky comes up to God and God's watching you? He's looking over every one of you. And when Ricky came up to him, did you notice what happened? He didn't say, yeah, okay, hold on a second, hold on. He turns and looks at Ricky and gives him his attention because God can watch the world and he can watch you and engage you at the same time. He's God. And when you're tempted to say, you know, God's busy with all this stuff. He's, he's holding the universe together. And when I come up and ask him for a jet ski, you know, am I bothering God? No, you're not. God loves you. He's concerned for you. Even when we're immature and ridiculous, we still get his full attention. I remember one time as a, as a pastor, I had this little kid that was 
was naked. He was pulling on my pants legs and Preacher, 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 preacher. And I was talking with somebody. Preacher, 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 preacher. And finally, I turned and I said, yeah, buddy, what is it? And the kid totally wasn't expecting that. And he went, um, um. <laughs> Did you see the sky? <laughs> and he wasn't expecting my attention. When I gave it to him, it surprised him. Listen, when you say, God, 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 you've got his attention immediately. And he's listening to you. He cares for you. He's got your security. He is looking out for the best for you always. Man has spent billions of dollars to simulate security when we just trust in God and we have the best security ever in the world. God is doing things that we don't even understand. He's working together for our good. That's why we thank him for something as simple as rain. That's why often I say, God, I want to thank you about the stuff I don't know about. Because there's millions of things I don't even realize that he's protecting me from. And I say, God, you know my limits. I just want to tell you thanks for what I don't know about. I really, really appreciate it. I think when we get to heaven and we see what could have befallen us, we're going to spend the first 10,000 years saying, Jesus, thank you so much for all of that. I had no idea, and I didn't fully appreciate who you really were. But now in my flesh, I see you, and I thank you for protecting me. And he's going to say, it's okay. I love you. In Exodus chapter 15, 26, he says, I am the God that healeth thee. That's him watching over you. That's him taking care of your security. I am the God that healeth thee. When you say, God, heal me, touch me, help me. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. He is listening and working together for your good. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. He's protecting us. He's caring for us. He's handling our security. It's the big stuff that God's taking care of. Psalm 17 and verse 8. David said, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. God is protecting you from harm. God is protecting the things that you love. Moms and dads, let me tell you something. When you become a Christian, God begins to see after the things that involve you. Sometimes even outside of your request in it. And when you dare to engage him in prayer and say, God, touch my son. Be with my daughter. Protect my brother. Touch my mom and dad. Man, the angels go double duty. They work in overtime. Because he begins to really magnify and concentrate all of his powers toward the things that you're concerned about. If parents and relatives ever realize the authority that they have as a child of God, God's protecting you when you're not asking. But when you're asking, you're going double duty to work together for your good. I want to conclude today a little story of what happened the other day. I was, I was doing a little driving time, and I was, had a group that were from KRLU, as the public station in, in Austin. And they did a barbecue tour. It's the second one I've had a privilege to do. It's a great job. <laughs> they go on a tour in this Texas area of, the, of some of the best barbecue places. And you go, you stop at one place, and 150 people walk into a barbecue place, and you eat, you know? And I went to a place called Black's Barbecue in, um, what's that town? There you go. You might, you might have been there. Lockhart, Texas. The oldest barbecue place in Texas. We walked in. And my group went into the dining room, and they were getting little niblets and stuff. The owner comes out and says, you driver? I said, yeah. He said, come here. I walk in the back there. Say what you want. I said, oh, are you serious? He said, I'm going to take care of the driver. I said, all right, man. All right. Um, I'd like some ribs. Beef, short ribs. I said, well, give me the baby bags. He said, all right. How many you want? I said, one's fine. I'll give you three. Chopped me three of them. He said, you like brisket? I said, yeah, I've been known to like brisket. He said, all right, here we go. 
whipped off three big old huge slices of the, I mean, he set me up. I walked out of there with my plate full, and these people had these little bitty uh, butcher paper things with one piece of brisket, a half a piece of sausage, and they went, who is he? What's going on there? You know, blessed to God, that's what I am. <laughs> we went to two other barbecue places, one in Luling, I think Luling uh, Meat Market, and another market downtown in Lockhart. And uh, everybody was just, you know, intoxicated with barbecue. Just, we had a great time, really neat. It was a great experience. We're driving back, and there's a bus with us, and I'm, 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 I'm out front, and as we're going home, I began to lose power in the bus. I thought, oh, no. And I looked at my gauges, and sure enough, my heat, you know, it was overheating. And in those big motor coaches, what happens is, is that when the engine overheats, the computer says it shuts the engine down before there's any damage. It shut down, man. The thing was coming to a close. And I thought, oh, boy. So we got a problem, and that was obvious. I pulled over to the side of the road, and I stood up and looked at those 56 people. I said, okay. Uh, we got a problem. We'll go, we're going to go look at it. <laughs> they didn't know preachers go back to open up an engine block. If they'd known that, they'd have really been worried because they'd known I have no idea what I'm doing. I said, but we're going to look at it. But here's the thing, guys. We're going to get a plan. We're going to devise a plan. And they said, okay. And they sat there in silence. I got out, walked to the back, opened up. We found the problem. The other guy did. <laughs> and he and I looked at each other. I said, all right, we need a plan. We need to help these people. So immediately we devised a plan. I began to get my people off mine and put them on his bus. And then we began to make some phone calls. And we did every, We found another driver that was in between jobs. We told them to meet us someplace. And I walked back in the bus. I said, okay, sorry for the inconvenience. This rarely happens. But please, if you leave the bus, go back to the one behind you. We do have some empty seats. And the rest of you have to stand for a brief amount of time. But we got a plan. They thanked me. They got off the bus, and I said, I said, sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. They said, it's not your fault. I was going, this is good. This is going really well. They got on the other bus. We moved them, and, and we, we met the other, the other uh, coach there, moved them into there, got, got them back to the, to the station. Probably, I think it was a 25-minute delay total. And the people were thanking us when it was over. They said, you know what? It's, it's, it's really tough that, that we had a problem, but there was a plan. And they said, because you guys had a plan and you worked pretty quick, it made the problem a bonding moment. You know what? They were actually thankful. It was really neat. They enjoyed the, the trip more because they had an experience and everything turned out okay. Listen, when you find yourself in crisis, you need to be just like those people. They weren't all Christians. I don't know if there were any or how many that were there. But they had patience. And they trusted us to have a plan, and we worked the plan. They said, what happens next? I said, there's a plan. So here's what they did. They sat quiet, and they trusted. And when it was over, they were thankful. And when that happened, I thought, I'm going to communicate that to my congregation, because that's what a Christian is supposed to be like in crisis. Oh, it's terrible what's happened. Oh, woe is me. But don't complain. Don't get impatient. Ask God, is there a plan? Well, I can tell you what he's going to answer. Yes, there's a plan. Okay, God. Then you sit quietly. And then when it's over, you thank God that there was a plan. You know what I heard? I heard that group, they already booked another trip with our same company. A lot of people say, we're going to go somewhere else. But because there was a plan, because there was action, they were patient and forgiving. Friend, you're going to go through some things. When you experience unexpected breakdowns, I want you to trust God. I want you to sit quietly in faith. And then when the problem is resolved and God's glory is seen and he's touched everybody in your life, then be thankful. Because your problem, your misery might be for someone else. That person at work, that person that you're dealing with may be driving you up a wall. But God has you as an agent of healing for them. See, it just might not be all about you this moment. It might be for someone else's benefit. And when that happens, be patient. Allow God to use you. These guys, Silo. I want you to see the, the, these guys sitting up here. We had another skit plan. 
And, and, and I called the whole team and said, hey, guys, I want you to be ready. We got something, got something. And I just, I just couldn't bring it to fruit. You'll eventually see that one probably. But we had to change it last minute. Look at them. They're here, ready to go. Brother David, you need us? We're here. What's the plan? You need to be willing to be used of God because he wants to use you. As a matter of fact, he trusts you. Now, let, wrap your mind around that. God trusts you. God, parents, you think that Ty, maybe, you know, when they ask me, they're honoring me. They trust you. There's a responsibility that goes with godparents. They wanted you here to stand with them. That's trust. You know, when you leave, you ought to pat on the back and say, you know what, I really appreciate you trusting me. It's a high honor. It is. And God trusts you. God's given you the surrounding environment that you have for one reason, not to be agitated with it, not to be bothered with it, but to change it, to be an agent, a source of healing in that environment. When you walk in that environment, it is, there's the potential of healing. You are a healing agent of God if you'll just sit quietly, be patient, and be who God's called you to be. God will use you to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Amen? Don't be a spoiled brat. You know? Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give God. My name's Jimmy. I need more. I need more me, 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 me. You better watch out, God. You upset me, I might not be in church next Sunday. I'll show you. Let me tell you something. You're not doing God any favors by coming to church. You're doing yourself a favor. Because when you come to church, you expose yourself to him, his counsel, and his worship. And you leave better because you've been around God. Be an agent of change. Thank God, because there is a plan. He's watching. Would you please bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for putting me here. You could have chose a donkey. You've done it before. No reason for a preacher to ever get the big head about anything. But God, you trusted me with these great people. You have set your affection upon them. You gave your life for them. And you put me in this pulpit. It's staggering. I want to thank you for trusting me and putting up with me and being patient with me. Help me, Father, to be better than I am for their sake. Help me, God, to hear from you more. And when I'm thick-headed, thick-skulled, and I'm being stupid, Knock some sense into me so that I can do some good for these people. Help me, Father, to be who you called me to be for them. Help them, God, to accept that same charge in their school, in their work, in their families, wherever they find themselves, in the beauty shop. It doesn't matter where it is, God. Use them. Challenge them to be a source of healing where they thought was a problem. That every problem we find ourselves in, it's an opportunity for us to rise up and become healing ointment to people who need to hear from you. We accept that charge, God. Help us, speak to us. And when we're in trouble, we pledge to you to trust in you, to sit quietly, and to offer you thanks. In Jesus' name, God's children said, Amen. Stand with me, please. Turn to page 12 of your hymn book. Sing this song. That is true. God will take care of you. Let's sing verse 4. Okay? Verse 4. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. God will take care. 